Welcome to the Ekankar Soul Adventure Podcast. A soul adventure is simply a way of saying that life is a journey of soul. And we're all on our way to awakening to our full spiritual potential and shining a light into the world that can uplift others. Over this past few years, people have definitely been looking for daylight, a way through the turmoil and changes that have rocked the world. Ekankar, this path of spiritual freedom, is here to share resources to equip you on your own unique quest for truth, love, and wisdom. And then there's an essential sacred word. The word is hue an ancient carrier of love between soul and God. This word is a tuning fork that aligns one with the Holy Spirit, the Yak, the life force. It is the clear voice of God with the power to transform the lead of human consciousness into the gold of an enlightened soul. You can find your own proof of the love and power of Hugh through the spiritual exercises of Eck, no matter what your background or faith is. Today, we have a guest who has found his own proof of this love and power on his life journey. We have Corey Austin on the line. He lives in Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands. How's it going, Corey? Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. It's indeed a pleasure. Corey, uh, before we dig deeper into the details of your story, I'm wondering if you can set the scene for how you came to your key turning points in life and where you are today. Thanks, Doug. I loved your intro. What stood out to me is when you talked about transforming your consciousness. So for me, I feel like that's exactly what happened. I had a really, a really awesome childhood, really adventurous, lots of spiritual growth, although it's not the word I would have put on it in those days. I remember sitting around as a really young boy looking at the sky and wondering, you know, where does it stop? Where does it end? And, you know, three or four, <laughs> I was thinking, well, who was I before I was who I am today? Did I have a body? Was I a ball of light? Was I a blob of something? <laughs> what was it? I was already wondering, like, what is this all about? There must be something more. Where where do I find these answers? And, you know, I'm sure I didn't think of it exactly in those terms, but I did wonder all those questions. And like most, you know, I had a lot of different chapters in my life and I took a couple of detours. And <laughs> would say they're the right or wrong turns. I took the turns I did and ended up where I did. And as a result, I ended up finding Ekankar, which answered a lot of those questions that I asked as a young boy. So I'm super grateful for that. Today, I own an architecture firm, more of a designer really, but I design houses all day. That's my passion. And when I'm not designing houses, I'm surfing by myself with my family, <laughs> really both. It's one of the greatest joys I've had recently is teaching my kid, my two kids how to surf and Hopefully, they'll be my little surf buddies later <laughs> <laughs> on the bigger stuff. Well, it just sounds like the fulfillment of a lot of dreams. Yet, fulfilling dreams sometimes takes a winding path and hardships along the way. So let's, let's dive into your story of how you got to where you are today and how you applied some of these resources and tools from the spiritual teachings. Awesome. Yeah, so... I had a really good childhood. I wouldn't say it's any any one or things fault. It's just around teenage years, I started to go a different path, one that some might call a dark path. I did a number of substances and alcohol, and that continued for a little over a decade. At age 24, it felt like my life just fell apart, like anything I ever perceived as valuable just kind of just fell through my fingers. I had nothing else to live for, couldn't get any worse. In hindsight, it's really the best thing that ever happened to me. Long story short, I ended up court mandated to a rehabilitation program. And if I'm quite honest, my motives were anything but pure. <laughs> I lied to the judge and told him I would do this. 
in order to avoid spending more time in jail. And so this was really just my way of getting back to my old ways as fast as possible. But I showed up that first day with every intention of just putting on a fake smile and pretending to uh, be getting better. But the moment I arrived at that rehab, something switched inside of me. And I still can't say exactly what it was, but it just felt like this wave of love just hit me. And it was the first time I felt emotions like this in a long time. My my parents, who I had really lost touch with, I didn't have a good relationship with anymore as a result of my own ways, of course, but I showed up at this rehab. They brought me, my mom and dad brought me there. And I literally just fell apart. I don't remember crying as an adult before then at all. And I just, just like, fell apart completely, became really emotional and just started telling my parents how much I love them and how I was going to do my best to make this work. And after they left me there, I just decided I was going to do anything and everything these people told me. I just, I really didn't have anything to lose at that point. So I figured if nothing else, if this didn't work, I wanted to know that I tried everything on my own to try and make it work. So one of the things they asked me to do was to start meditating. I had no idea what that meant or what it was, what it looked like to me, but I just started picking up some random books. I mean, I don't remember what I did. I just found a quiet spot and started doing some breathing exercises or something. I remember a challenge I had in those days was just sitting still at all for more than a minute or so. It just felt like I wasn't having any progress. So ironically, I came across a book called The Flute of God written by Paul Twitchell, who was the founder of Ekin Carr before Surrey Herald in the 60s. And so I read this book, and I never read a book in school, ever. Not more than a paragraph when I was forced to. And I opened this book, and I just figured I'd scan the first paragraph. The first paragraph led to the first page, and then I, for some reason I just had to see what was on the next page, like a literal page turner. <laughs> so I just figured I'd read the first sentence. I read the first sentence, and before I knew it, I was at the end of the next page. And that continued over and over until I found myself at page 40. It was like the middle of the night by this time. I could not stop reading it. Finally, I went to bed, put the book next to my uh, nightstand. I woke up. First thing I wanted to do in the morning was start reading it again. And I immediately remember coming to a spiritual exercise where he explained how to do the hue which I was actually familiar with because my father told me about this exercise when I was little. I knew this was the answer I was looking for. (laughs) I knew it wasn't an accident. I came across this book and I was supposed to be doing this meditation thing. I was like, this seems close enough to me. (laughs) So he called it more of a contemplation. So instead of trying to escape your thoughts, we embrace them. And so it talked about redirecting that energy and just thinking of something positive or opening your heart to something or someone that you love. So every morning I woke up really early before everyone else so I could have the peace and quiet and I would go find somewhere to sing Hugh. Like I said, I'd open my heart, I would try and think of something that would make me feel some sort of love and then I would just sing Hugh for, it might have been five minutes, 10 minutes, I'm not really sure. I just As long as I felt comfortable, I just tried not to push it, but I did the best I could to follow the <laughs> directions that Paul Twitchell had given in the book. And I'll be honest, I didn't own, I didn't really notice any differences. In hindsight, I knew there was a lot of differences. They were just so subtle, I wasn't picking up on it at the time. But other people were noticing. When I look back on those times, I realized that one thing, you know, was that I was waking up really early every morning to do this hue. And afterwards, I just felt good. But I knew I had to find some way to export some of this <laughs> positive vibes that I was pulling in. So every morning before everyone woke up, I did my hue and then I went through the refrigerator and I'd pull out the bacon and the eggs and all the flour and I'd make homemade biscuits like I used to do as a kid. And by the time everyone woke up, the whole table was covered in biscuits and eggs and bacon. And everyone's like, why is he doing this? <laughs> the counselor started asking me, you know, Corey, is everything okay? <laughs> So they're wondering if I'm kind of overdoing something. And I said, no, I just feel great. (laughs) They wanted to make sure I wasn't on any other kind of medication that they didn't (laughs) know about that was making me feel overly happy. Um, 
But in hindsight, it was it was the hue. What occurred to me is that nothing outside of me actually changed. It's just the way I'm perceiving the world changing your consciousness. When I sing hue, it literally is like me riding a different vibrational wave. It's like I tap into this. It's not like we're using it to control anything else, but I do use it as a tool to help me change my perspective and tap into this different state of consciousness. And I start noticing things that are already there, but I just wasn't aware of them before. And then one of the biggest turning points for me was when I was, I still remember exactly where I was. I was driving down this certain road, the white and yellow lines on either side. My hands are on the steering wheel. I remember exactly what I was looking at. And this thought was going through my mind where I started to become a little bit discouraged. I was like, all right, I'm reading about all these really neat experiences that Paul was talking about in the books that will start to happen when I do my spiritual exercises. And I hadn't had any of those experiences yet. And I became, became discouraged. Maybe I wouldn't see any of those things. Are you speaking yeah, of? I think it's you speaking of soul travel, the inner dimensions, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, there was soul travel and being able to become aware of past lives and just any type of inner experiences like that. Now, I actually was having really rich dreams, but I always had had those, so I didn't see them as any different. <laughs> it's, it's like I had this entitled attitude, like, "Well, that's already <laughs> expected. What else am I going to get out of this?" And so. I'm driving down the road feeling like I haven't really gained anything from all this extra time I'm investing in these spiritual exercises. And all of a sudden, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized I've been sober for a month and a half or two months now. I don't know the exact time frame, but it had been about a month and a half or two months further than I'd ever made it. And here I was in the car realizing I've gone for a month and a half or two months completely sober, but not only sober, happy. That's a huge difference. And so in this moment, I realized that there was nothing else in my life that had changed and that there was really nothing to be happy for. <laughs> if, I mean, if you analyzed it from the physical sense, I was stuck in this little rehab, living in a little box with a bunch of other grumpy <laughs> guys. That was, I had no car. I had literally nothing, no physical possessions that I could say, oh, this is making my life richer. There was nothing I could put my finger on other than this joy and happiness I felt for life. So in that moment, I'm not sure who I felt like I was speaking to or what, but I guess the creator, as I viewed it at that point in my life, I kind of had this inward conversation with. I said, I remember kind of saying, sorry, I feel really silly now. And if I never see any of the stuff that I was reading in the books, the soul travel, the past life awareness, any of these other inner experiences that I've heard about, if I never see any of those at all, I'm going to continue doing the hue and the spiritual exercises every day because I realize and I acknowledge that they are making a difference for me. And I just remember saying thank you. And that was a huge turning point for me. So the funny thing is after that, I remember it seems like that was the first moment when I was actually able to start having other types of experiences. I've often felt since then like that was my first lesson. My life will never go back to what it was. This is my life moving forward. Wow. I know a lot of other people who are listening may know people or may have taken a similar journey. What would you say to someone who's going through that dark night of soul right now? from your own experience, having been there and having made the journey to your life today? You know, one thing I often think about is how if Corey back then <laughs> could have a conversation with Corey mm -hmm. today, what would that look like? Corey back then wouldn't even believe that I'm the same person. Nobody that I know then recognizes me. I mean, in every way, <laughs> you know, physically, I'm sure, but also just, I'm a completely different person. I mean, I, I know me, my true self is soul. I'm the same soul, but I'm completely transformed from what I used to be in my mindsets, the way I viewed everything. And so I'm sure other people see me as differently as well. But I, I think that if, if I could convince Corey 15 years ago, 
if I could convince him that this really is me and that this life is available, I don't think there's even a doubt I would have changed instantly, but I just wouldn't have known where to go, where to start. And so, I mean, for me, it was, it started with the spiritual exercises. We've been talking about the Hugh and the spiritual exercises and this whole transformational process. And so we want to play an audio clip from Sri Harold Klemp. He's the Mahanta, the living Ek master, spiritual leader of Ekankar. And this clip really fits in with our discussion today. So we're going to listen to this short clip from Sri Harold giving a talk at a seminar some years ago. This ocean wave that flows from the heart of God is a two-way wave. It flows out to the ends of creation. And out here on the end of creation somewhere, we find ourselves. And if we can learn how to ride this wave or this sound current back home to God, we can jump aboard the way a surfer does a wave and ride it back to the heart of God. This is what the teachings of Akankar are about. This is the great mystery about dream study and soul travel. It's learning how to ride in a metaphorical sense and actually in a very literal sense, this wave of God, which is the voice of God. This wave is the creative force that came from God and created all worlds. That's how God created the worlds, through his word. And this word is the Holy Spirit. And this word issues forth and the echo comes back. Well, we want to ride the wave back. Well, I don't think there's any clip or quote I've ever read that resonates more than that one with me. I think it's the best analogy for me because when I do my spiritual exercise and I sing to you, I literally do feel like I've caught a wave. It's, it's like that new vibration that you tap into. It's not just a sound, it is, but it's also a feeling for me. It's like I feel this new energy within me and it just carries. But yeah, the feeling of a wave, catching a wave and then riding it out to the end, ends of creation, which kind of reminds me as a boy when I was thinking of what is out there? What There's got to be an end point somewhere. No, but there can't be. It's like this amazing mystery that God's left us with. It's like he left us unable to imagine forever, but at the same time, we know it has to exist because what else could there be? We can't imagine it not going forever, but we can't quite imagine it going forever. <laughs> so riding this wave to the end of creation and then back is just, it feels like it encapsulates everything I've ever been searching for in this life <laughs> within that one quote. And it's so fascinating that it's, it's more than a metaphor. It is literally this current that has energy, that has vibration, that is this love current, this life current. And we thought we'd take a moment for our audience to experience that. So I thought we'd try an exercise that's in a, a small booklet called Is Life a Random Walk? by Harold Clamp. Hugh is an ancient, holy name for God. Simply sit or lie in a quiet place and sing Hugh. This age-old song lets the voice of God enter you as love, light, or sound. The light and sound of God are integral parts of divine love, known to but a few. The twin pillars of God's love, they are the mainstays of the Ek teachings. In fact, the spiritual travelers of Ek ride them out of the body and into the cosmic seas, via soul travel, like a surfer riding ocean waves. This method is a direct route to finding love, 
wisdom, and spiritual freedom. What a beautiful sound. When we listen inwardly for the sound current, we're listening for the sound of home and the ocean of love and mercy. Well, my friend, do you have any concluding insights to share with us today? The last thing that came to me was just, if I was to give someone in my shoes 10 years ago, the advice that I wish someone had given me, it's, to not have any expectations. If you want to start singing the hue, then just have no expectations and just see what happens, see what's meant to be. And you might be getting way more than you (laughs) expected. Today, my life is light years beyond what I ever could have imagined. Just more than I even can put into words. Just open your heart and whatever's meant to be. And that's what makes the adventure. That's what makes it the soul adventure is being open to what life can offer. And it's infinite and it's abundant and it's a joy. And it's been a joy here with you today, Corey. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks so much. So if that exercise interested you, that writing the cosmic seas as a spiritual traveler, you can get this book for free. It's a small book. It comes along with a companion book called Ekinkar, Ancient Wisdom for Today. Feel free to call 1-800-LOVE-GOD. You can also go online and get them as digital PDFs. So thank you, everyone. We look forward to being with you again on our next Ekinkar Soul Adventure podcast. Bye for now. <laughs>